If you've been watching the show for a while, you know that we have mentioned the book Mana by Marshall Brain many, many times. Last week, Peter suggested we get Marshall on the show. This week, we have him for today's Not So Critical Update. Thanks for joining us. We, uh, uh, John actually had recommended Mana to us a How many months times? ago. Yeah. 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 And, uh, then for a long time, we were trying to get Peter to read it. He finally did. Everybody fell in love with it. So even though it's a book that you wrote 20 years ago, we're like super into it. We just discovered it. Thank you. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> it's held up pretty well. Yeah. You know, it, uh, it doesn't necessarily feel dated yet, you know, so. Oh yeah. Yeah, I have to say. So like like these guys said, and as I mentioned in the email, um, we're inviting you on. I they've been bugging me to read Mana for like a year, seriously, a long time. <laughs> and it's I, I know it's a short book, and I kept on saying, Yeah, 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 I'm gonna read it, I'm gonna read it. It looks great. And then I finally did a cut a few weeks ago and I, I completely fell in love with it. But yeah, wow. so when did you write it? When did you start writing Mana? That's exactly what I wanted to know too. Oh, I uh This is going to be a, a. I'm trying to compress a thousand sentences into two. The um, the the thing is, I do a lot of writing. Like you know, I wake up in the morning and I have kind of this compulsion to write something. And so that that intro, the piece at the very beginning of it in the restaurant, that just popped out of my head one day around you know I I don't even remember, but let's just call it 2001. And wow. and that had, I, I don't know why, but that just seems so obvious to me. Like, why don't you just put headsets on these people so that, you know, they do what they're supposed to do in that context. If you're, a, you know, an evil overlord, I'm not right. saying I want to do this. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you're, you know, running a fast food restaurant and you want people to do what you want them to do, why wouldn't you just start micromanaging them? And, uh, and so that popped out. And, and then, so now you have it in your hand, like, and what do you do with it? Uh, and so the rest of the, I mean, it's a novella, right? It's not even a novel. It, it only takes maybe two hours to read it. I don't know. It's not very long. So, uh, you know, so I just, I, I had never done any fiction writing before. So I just tried to wrap a story around it and see what would happen. And now here we are, what, 20 years later, and I'm really... I have a whole bunch of notes about what a novel based on that idea would look like. Oh, so, so, so you, are you going to be writing a, a follow-up, a sequel? It would be... Uh, have you ever heard of the book about um, being in kindergarten? Um, like, I, I can't remember the name of the book, but it's something like everything I learned in kindergarten, if I would just do those things today as an adult, I would be on track, you know, right. like don't clean up your own messes. And, you know, it's a pretty, inter well, that started as an essay and then it ah. expanded and then it expanded. So Ma Mana, you know, Mana 2, I don't even know, Mana, the <laughs> second edition, <laughs> Mana, the novel. Uh, I, <laughs> I've, I've been approached twice about making it into a movie, but that has never gelled, you know? So wow. there's a lot I've learned. There's a lot more that goes into a movie beyond someone calling you up and saying, Hey, I think this would make a good movie. So, uh, but it, it would make a good movie, you know, yeah. if it was fleshed out a little bit more. And so I'm going to, this is on my list of things <laughs> to do uh, is to double it in size and turn it into a real novel. Cool. What wow. I really like about your writing is, I mean, it's just like common sense almost, right? Like you start with kind of a simple idea and just think it through. The uh, the essay about Musk uh, wanting to send a million people to Mars to ask the question like, okay, but what would that actually look like? Like seems very fundamental, but you get a lot of content out of that. Um, yeah, you do. And it's so amazing. <laughs> very similar pr approach in the Doomsday book. Um <laughs> Where where does it go? 
uh, where does it, what's it? Like, uh, so like you make all these observations, do you feel uh, like, uh, uh, you, you're having the impact that you want? Oh, or do people get it? Do you get the engagement that you want? Wow. We could do a whole lecture series on that. <laughs> couldn't we? Uh, yeah. Let's, hey, let's sorry. Just... <laughs> Side question. Do you have a particular impact that you're trying to make? Do you have an agenda? The, well, let's think about the Elon Musk thing. Uh, so he, had, I think he had 2016, he says, hey, we're going to send a million people to Mars. And that, to me, just lit an explosion in my head. I wrote, th you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of words about that idea because if you do think it through, like if you wanted to build Earth 2.0 on Mars and you wanted it to be independent in case Earth blew up, it, I doubt you could do it with a million people, not at the level of technology we are now. It would take a million people just to run the semiconductor side of <laughs> that because semiconductors are hard, you know, like at the TMSC level, like, it, you know, at two nanometers or wherever we're at now. Uh, it's hard. It's a huge network of suppliers and people and technicians and everything. And a million person society might be able to do that one aspect, but you still have to make aluminum foil and sandpaper and, you know, all this other stuff that people need. You have to grow all the food and everything. It, I mean, if you if you think it all the way through, and you, and then you start asking <laughs> right. questions, like, are we going to have pets on Mars? I just <laughs> love that question. Like, well, I don't know <laughs> because you know there are advantages to pets, and there's also disadvantages to pets, and uh, and someone's going to decide that, right? Because yeah, you're not just taking a factory that's going to make everything. You're taking okay. like every factory across the entire world yeah. that's making all the individual things that we need and all the things that they need. Right. And yeah. underneath each of those is a stack of special skills that that we just completely, you know, gloss over. But I did a show on National Geographic called Factory Floor, and we visited, I, let's just say, 20 factories in the United States and did in-depth tours of them. And it's it's hard to make stuff like, I mean, it's like just fluorescent light bulbs. The factory that makes fluorescent light bulbs is insane. It is. I mean, it's so big and so complicated. You know, you have to melt the sand into glass and then form the glass into tubes. It's just like, Oh my gosh. And that's just for fluorescent light bulbs. So it is, it's super hard and then all the rules of that society that we argue about on earth you know now well i you don't even know like is elon musk going to be in the commander of mars <laughs> right and he just by dictate decides abortion or no abortion I, right. how do you how are you going to figure that out on a um, whole blank sheet your your kind of final conclusion was we have to go through this whole process of deciding who's going to go, how are they going to be governed, what's that structure going to look like, so yeah. why don't we just do that here? Exactly. <laughs> right. If so why, why don't we just do that here, Marshall? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. And, uh, well, and this goes back to your original question, which is what kind of impact. So somehow you have to get a whole bunch of people on board to to make a you know a play like that have you heard about what the building they proposed in dubai or saudi arabia oh yeah the, the line a 170 yes. kilometer city yeah. yeah yes in a line like that seems very odd for an architecture you know, why not make it a circle is the obvious first question you ask because if you're at one end of the line and you want to get to the other end it's 70 but if it was a circle you'd always be at most 35 so i mean uh you, i mean you just start asking questions like that but they at least have the money to be credibly talking about building something yeah you know of that magnitude Whereas, let's say we wanted to build a million-person prototype Mars city in the United States, just as an example, uh, you'd have to have a lot of people 
on board uh, and interested to get that kind of thing going. And so what I do is I write stuff like that and put it out in public and try to see what resonates, uh, you know, what catches people's imagination and stuff. And not a lot of people, I mean, I'm super interested in it and here we are talking about it, but there's been no upwelling of, of common interest. Just, well, and it's just like climate change. So I, mean, so, so I had a couple of, couple of thoughts about, about manner, right? So, Okay. One of the things I loved about it was that you um, you really kind of practically thought out how you, how much money you would need and where the place would be and and like if you got this many people then uh, that kind of like the, it seemed like an actual feasible you mean something for that the, could actually, you mean for the Australia project the Australia project yeah yeah, yeah sorry um, and yeah that's that when I was when I I've told a bunch of people about it uh, since I read it of course. Um, and that was the thing that most people picked up on. I was like, oh, well, right. So it's something that could actually happen then. I'm like, I was like, yeah, yeah. If you got, I mean, it probably would be more money now and it was written a while ago and so blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I think so. Barring, uh, you know, the rep, the recycling, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> the money, getting them, <laughs> but it felt like perhaps that was the challenge was getting enough people to be interested. And it feels like this is a topic we talk about a lot it might have just have a marketing problem. If it could be marketed well enough to people, getting them to invest, maybe that's it. Maybe. And, and in the case of the Australia project, that's a really interesting continent, the way it's architected, because all the people are on the outside and the middle is kind of blank because of heat and, you know, other spiders yeah. and all kinds of other <laughs> weird stuff. That Everything that's trying to kill you. <laughs> in the center. But if you can... You're literally right, Peter. If you can get Australians to say, damn, yes, let's create a utopia here. You know, it's, it's completely feasible. And yeah. it is to some degree a marketing problem. And, uh, and I'll just say again, climate change is stuck in this exact same little loop where yeah. we know we have to do something. Uh, but how like how do you get a whole planet full of people to decide on a direction and then you know start doing it together and and we have terrible examples of it like world war ii where the entire planet marched to destroy one another it was horrible i mean yeah. think let's, how much, that. <laughs> let's think how much you know time and effort and people and materials got spun up for world war ii if we can do that for climate change climate change would be done you know or it, yeah it would be uh well on its way to being better than it is now where you know we're we're just on a path to doom <laughs> just that pesky profit motive <laughs> yes so yeah. which what do you got, John? Sorry, John, you got some? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. I've been. I wanted you guys to kind of get it out. You know, I, I saw okay. you, you wanted to just Peter's ready word to keep... vomit. You were word vomiting one after the other. So yeah. it's my, uh, no, Peter. My turn, Marshall. I want to let you know that I've been a fan of yours, big fan, for like ten years. I've been pushing your book <laughs> for the better part of a decade. I am a huge <laughs> fan of Mana. I love it. Uh, I've read it. Anyway, that's all we got time for. I'm afraid. So, uh, uh, um, sorry, guys. <laughs> so, one question I have for you. Um, a couple of questions, but I guess the big one is, you know, it's been almost it, it's been almost 20 years now since you started working on Mana and, and publishing the first draft, or or um, yeah. So, what in your opinion has changed since you wrote it, and are we still heading in the direction of robot managers and low income uh, dome homes? Oh, interesting. So, it, well, at the beginning, when I said it's held up pretty well, uh, you know, we're definitely going down the right track to create, you know, a place where poor people are imprisoned in terraform foam housing. That, um, I, even in the United States, that just seems like the track we're headed down. It, it, you would have hoped that we would have somehow gotten enlightened. Uh, and I don't necessarily want to go political here, but I, you got to look back at the, <laughs> the last five years and just wonder what the heck happened. Uh, and and it, the dystopian side of it seems right on target, you know, right on track for something. 
because people are just getting poorer and poorer in the United States. The, you know, the, the body politic is, is just getting crushed and, uh, and you would like there to be a better way. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I no, no, that was great. Yeah. Um, and then my second question is, yeah, do I'm you think, do you think that the Australia project could still function with privacy added? Right. Because a big portion of the Australia project was that everything is transparent, including everything you do. You're tracked completely. Would there be a scenario where we can maybe build an Australia project that still retains some sort of privacy, some so that keeps your privacy intact? OK, so let's define privacy. Sure. Um, I can take a shower in peace or I can. um I don't know, you know, maybe because I guess the the problem here is that without in the Australia project, taking away privacy allows you to minimize crime basically to a zero. Right. And yes, but then is is having one too many drinks and, you know, urinating outside a crime? Probably. But like, should I be kicked out of the Australia project so for it? They're like so, that's just one of the many <laughs> dumb examples. John, of, yeah. the the one that always comes to me, my mind is like the pre crime piece that like if the computer senses that you're about to commit a crime, it'll oh, intervene right. and, and stop yeah, yeah, you yeah, from doing yeah. it. That's right. So like that feels like a privacy issue. I guess you could argue, well, if only the computer knows, then no other people know. So it's you still have your privacy. What's your what's your like? How would you define that, Marshall? Hmm. Well, the problem with privacy is that you end up with uh you know a whole bunch of people storming the capital of the united states and you have to do this enormous amount of work to figure out who they were and and some of them you don't even know now i don't think mm -hmm. they caught even half the people and very few of the people at the upper echelons you know they're all it's undetermined but it's likely mm -hmm. they're all going to escape right? Because they're able to do stuff. They're able to hide, you know, that right now we're seeing all this stuff about people erasing their text messages in the secret service and now in the department of defense. And, and then you get what happens on the internet where these anonymous trolls are just coming out of nowhere and saying whatever they want, even if it's not true or it's, you know, and you get bots Right. On, you know, half of Twitter, I don't know what the percentage is, but let's just say half of Twitter is not even people. And and all of that is eliminated um, if you don't, like, if it's all out non-anonymous. And you so, that, Peter? Everything. See that, Peter? Uh, I, I, I'm not commenting. I'm not commenting. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, it, I mean, it's a, it goes both ways. I don't have anything... Uh, against coming up with some line like everything you do inside your own house is private Let, I, I'm just making stuff up here sure. but let's just that would solve the showering problem and it would also solve the what you're doing in the bedroom problem and it would solve you know a lot of health privacy and all kinds of other things if you know inside your house bubble is private and maybe you extend that bubble to some degree uh, but I think that would be the mental approach we would have to take is to figure out where is the line that causes uh, privacy to turn into dysfunction and, and, and see where that line is. Clearly, letting anybody post anything they want on Facebook is not necessarily the greatest idea because now you have Russia posting on Facebook and you have... Sure. You know, there's just all this stuff that then happens. And if those, all that was tied back to a real human being, there would be uh, someone to talk to, someone to prosecute, whatever. Yeah, we've talked about um, South Korea does something like this where they tie a person's online identity to their the equivalent of a social security number. So, you know, if you make a, a video game account in an online video game, that's tied to your identity. You get one account. If you make a Facebook account or a Twitter account or whatever, all of these are tied back to your social security number because um, they have some really like crazy laws regarding, um, I think it's libel or, or, or slander or whatever, so you, or, or harassment. So they, they are very, very 
open about this that you cannot harass people online if you do like you can almost be blacklisted in a way and this is a country that's you know they're a democracy they're super progressive um leader in, in innovation and it's still something that's occurring over there um but thank you that was a really that was a really good answer and not something i considered actually was that we'd have to maybe talk about it um <laughs> so my my last question is and I read your doomsday book. It was really cool. There was a few things that I don't want to spoil on the show. Um, <laughs> that a, few scen- <laughs> a few scenarios that I really liked because it like, it reminded me of, of mana one. I think it was, um, it was maybe the automation scenario. I, I, that might've been the name. Um, attack. Well, no, no, no. That's my question. But ah, right, sorry. Marshall just gave me permission to spoil away, which I really liked the 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 whole we could automate. We are automating away majority of the lower workforce um, and we'll probably still see it just inching towards blue collar and potentially other white collar jobs like accountants and whatnot. So I thought that was really interesting. But in the Doomsday book, use a grid attack as a scenario. Um, this is something we've seen previously in real life with the colonial pipeline hack. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? How do you think governments should better prepare? Okay, so we have all this infrastructure uh, out in public, uh, easily, easily attacked. And it's highly vital, you know, like the Colonial Pipeline, you can't have people driving if you break up the Colonial Pipeline. And you can't, I mean, the grid attack is so, if it were exploited, is so uh, debilitating that it just, it's, you know, we, we built all this infrastructure on the assumption that no one would ever try to hurt it. And, and now we're coming into a society where people seem to be interested in hurting things right? The, yeah. Like the, the capital attack being a great example. So what if those 2,000 people decide, oh, we're going to take down the grid going into Washington, D.C., for example? That's uncomfortable and not difficult because you have so many points of attack that, you know, it's so highly vulnerable that it just is uh, horrible to think about the uh, evildoers getting that in their heads so then you then you have to start to think okay how would we harden this and this is exactly what happened in 9 11 right is that the pi- the the door into the pilot's office the cockpit it was just a door you know you just turned the knob and you could walk in well that doesn't seem real smart in retrospect because we assume that no one would go in and knife attack the pilots. But now we find out, oh, shoot, people will walk into the cockpit and, and stab the pilots. And so now that door is like, I mean, it's steel reinforced barricade with all this security protocol to open it. And it's crazy now. But that's what we had to do in order to have pilots in an airplane. And, and so you the whole premise of the doomsday book is that, well, what if you just took that idea that vulnerable right. stuff needs to be hardened and you applied it across the whole country, say, um, yeah, so the power grid vulnerable water supplies, vulnerable gas lines, pipelines, oil pipelines, whatever, all highly vulnerable. And you just start enumerating all of that. Sure. And so if you need, 30 new things to worry about in your life. Then, uh, <laughs> the, the blessing and the curse of that book. It's so depressing. <laughs> it's like, so, it's so, I mean, imagine writing it. Yeah. It's, well, that's, that's actually my last question. Sorry, Peter, let me get this one out of the way. That's no, the fine. last one. Re- going through the sources in the doomsday book. Cause as I was reading it, I was like, shit, this must've taken Marshall, like, <laughs> years to compile how long did it take you to work and finish the doomsday book Mm. okay that book was like on this amazing high intensity deadline 
like they the publisher came and said we want a doomsday book and i said okay and they said well and we want it in less than a year like we want you to write the whole thing in less than a year and i i think there's like 900 references in it or something an enormous bibliography and so that was basically four hours a day for that entire period wow uh you know, was spent researching and writing that book. And there was a Did fantastic you- editor behind it who tried to keep me, you know, on the rails because sometimes when you're writing that fast, it's, you know, you can, you can go off the rails. And so you need someone to just be the, the person looking down on the forest and saying, Oh, no, we aren't going that way, you know? And so fantastic editor helped with Did that. You- are you suffering from PTSD after writing that? Because I mean, like a, a, <laughs> yeah, a like, year of looking into do- stuff into like that. The worst aspects of humanity. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it's still, it still affects me today. Like I have a different, having gone that deep on that many yeah. topics wow. is hard, but what I'm doing now is I'm writing about climate change. That's just a little part of the Doomsday Book. Just a bit of, for a bit of fun, you know. Yes, it's climate change. And it's so hard because I mean we're looking at an apocalypse possibility here if we don't change. And how do you get all of humanity to change? In the, you mentioned the profit motive, like it, in the context of giant corporations who don't want to change and have a thousand reasons not to it's climate change is a hard thing it's yeah. a glo- i yeah, guess the biggest sure. problem with climate change too is let's say sure you have campaigned all of america to change we're still connected to a different continent that's not going to change <laughs> and the guys across like two miles from alaska they're not going to change right no. and that's the big issue too is how do you globally agree um to, to drastically alter the way we live. Yes. And I write a weekly column about that. I mean, look, what's the nature of the threat we face and what are we doing now? And what should we be doing if we want to, we, we can't stop the threat at this point. I, all we can do is diminish how bad it gets. But what, what's the weekly uh, column? Sorry. Uh, I write, a. it's a, called tech wire. If you, uh, if you go to, I think it's W R A L techwire.com is the W R A L being a local news station in Raleigh. They asked me to write a column and I'm happy to help the community. And it's gone quite a bit broader than the community at this point, but it is, uh, it is a weekly Nice. Thing. And uh, this week, there's so much bad news on the climate front. Yeah, it's really, I mean, if you're paying attention, it's really uh, hard to yeah. see how bad off we are. Yeah, let's not paying yeah. attention. Um, I think we only asked for about a half hour of your time. So oh. we'll try and wrap up here. I got one more question. Uh, do you have any after this? Do you have anything you want to plug while you're here? We, we uh, talked about Doomsday, awesome book. Check it out. We're still going to recommend Mana. Go check that out. The WRL Tech column. What do you got coming up? Um, you know, if you come to MarshallBrain.com, it, a lot of what I write is free on that website. Like Mana, it, it's just right there on the website. I Which is so cool, by the way. So cool. I just, it's just so cool. Okay, so if you are interested, <laughs> the Elon Musk book is free. Like, I mean, they're just there. So. Uh, and what that does is it helps improve uptake, but it doesn't ever show up on the New York Times bestseller list. You know, <laughs> if, a, if a 10 million people read Mana, which I think is probably the right number, uh, you know, the New York Times doesn't track free stuff. So, <laughs> uh, so y- you can come and there's a link to the column I write there, you know, so that might be a place to come and cool. What's your what's your next question? And I don't so I have feel a time like on. I feel like it's off brand for me to ask for something more positive, and maybe also for you <laughs> to answer that way. But I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best as we sit here today. 
threats to democracy, global warming, all these, you know, financial problems. Do you see any cause for optimism? Mm. Well, if you're in the United States, Kansas voted yesterday on on abortion, right? Uh, if you're not in the United States, this is completely off the radar. So to protect abortion, to protect abortion in Kansas, okay. and what? And if you look at all the states that surround Kansas, they're all now locking down, and so. Um, if you are in favor of abortion being a right that women have as part of their reproductive health space, then that was a tiny bit of good news that happened. Be you know, like a fundamental right was taken away from women a couple months ago by the Supreme Court, and that was a tiny victory. It, it showed that you could get people out to think about things, um, you know, in, in right. a rational way, I guess. Uh, yeah. So I, I found that vote yesterday uplifting because Flicker there's a, of hope. Yes, exactly. And, and I, if I sat here long enough, I could probably think of some others, but that's the, <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind there's just so yeah. much uh, awful stuff sure. that it, we've done this brand for both of us i get yeah, it yeah we've done this before where we've tried deliberately we had one yeah. week where we tried to just have positive stories just as a work. challenge to ourselves it was so hard oh my yeah. god it it's, was, it's so difficult to think of good things and also it doesn't it, the news won't publish good stuff right yeah bad that's bad horrible. shit bad shit sells generally speaking so it's yeah. it's kind of always in your head Yes, but like I have four children who are all in college and uh, and I teach in a college, like in a university, right? I'm a faculty member. I have 100 students a semester, say, and I know them. I interview all my students, I blah, blah, blah. And it is hard to grow up in a society with this much stuff roiling around like this yeah. absolutely was not part of my college experience right you know like the future looked bright there was even a song about how bright the future looked i mean <laughs> it it college now and college then are on different planets it wow. really is there's so much stuff our 20 year olds are thinking about you know, you just rattled off a list, uh, you know, from the economy to the jobs, to the climate, to fundamental rights, to, yeah. uh, to will we even have a democracy in America in, in two years? It just, there's so many, and, and you either embrace it. Like I got my both arms wrapped around it, trying to <laughs> see the whole picture or you just turn off. Right. All right. It's, you know, don't watch the news. <laughs> true i don't we just try to find tech articles um but that was i think that's that's it for me and if you guys have any other questions no other than just to say thank you so much once again marshall for for joining us it, oh. it was just an email out of the blue and didn't expect you to say yes so it's really privileged to have you on here honestly thank, uh, thank you well i'm super happy and i hope that your channel you know live long and prosper i mean you're out there <laughs> in the wild trying to trying to do the same thing you're trying to build yeah. an audience and and get engagement and and i hope this helps in some tiny way thank you marshall thank you. Really appreciate, appreciate it marshall it. okay have a good thanks one. for joining us today <laughs> thanks bye bye, bye.